I, I want to talk to you about an idea. So when Martin Luther King, in his I Had a Dream speech, said that all people were created equal, he was drawing attention to the segregation and the discrimination that were faced by African-American people. Now, in using the idea of equality to draw attention to those disadvantages, he was using one of the most powerful and influential ideas of the last three centuries. The idea of equality is so embedded in how we think about society, how it should be structured, and the relations between people, that I'm not going to defend that idea today. But I do want to say something about what kind of idea it is, what it is, what are the threats to it, and how we might get more of it. So when we think about the idea of equality, what, what do we think of? We think about things that, such as, no matter where you happen to be born, you should have an equal chance of a good life. No matter what your skin colour is or your race, you should have an equal chance of a good life. We also think things such as, everyone should have equal freedom to think and believe what they like. These kind of rights and opportunities are central to what we think about when we think about equality. But equality is, is more than that. These rights and opportunities have a particular character. So when the economist and philosopher Adam Smith in the 18th century was writing about these issues, he said that everyone ought to have the ability to appear in public without shame. Okay? Now he was talking in a different time, in a different place, in a different context. But he drew our attention to something very important. And that is, no matter what your identity or what your relationships are, you should have the right to be treated respectfully when you're living in society and when you're undertaking the things you think are most important. Respectful relationships are also a key to what it is to live in a society of equals. Being able to have a relationship, have an identity, uh, without fear of being denigrated or demeaned is also central to what it is to live in a society of equals. But equality is more than that still. It's more than just rights and opportunities and particular types of relationships. It's having the conditions and the resources uh, to, to live the life that you want. <coughs> so when we say uh, that, that we want to live in a society, we also mean, I believe, that we need certain resources. Resources that make us healthy, resources that uh, make us mobile, and resources that make us safe. Now, we don't care about these resources in and of themselves. We care about them because they're means. They're the means to living the life that you choose, whatever that happens to be. But note a very important thing about these kind of resources. When we say that you have the right to be safe, we don't just mean you have the right to be safe, we mean you should be safe. So when you turn up to work, when you buy medicine, or when you walk down the street, we don't just want you to have the opportunity of being safe, we actually want you to be safe. Similarly, we think that children <coughs> ought not just to have the opportunity to be educated, they actually should be educated. And indeed, more controversially, we say that citizens uh, in a modern society ought not just to have the opportunity to think critically or be autonomous, they should actually be those things. So if you're an egalitarian, that is someone who puts equality front and centre of your thinking about justice and society, you believe that equality is made up of rights and opportunities, relationships of a particular sort, and these kind of resources. That's what equality is for many egalitarians. So now we understand a bit about the idea of equality, what kind of threats are there to equality uh, in the modern world? Well, it seems to me that, that one of the most pervasive and important threats that there is to there being equality, and for us being able to live in a society of equals, is economic, the, the inequality uh, that's generated by unequal amounts of income and wealth. So, as we can see here, in the United States, the top 20% of households are around 84% of the wealth in the country, whereas the bottom 40% own a paltry 0.3% of the wealth. Now, that, that's a huge inequality. But not only that, things seem to be getting worse. So, the top 0.1% of 
households have been increasing their share of the wealth in American society for the last three decades. Now, people are right, money isn't everything, but money is, and wealth are important for obvious reasons. They enable you to do more things, and when there becomes gross inequalities and concentrations of wealth, uh, that also changes the power dynamics in society such that people, uh, their, their ability to do the things they want is compromised. So that's one threat to living in a society of equals, it seems to me. But, but let me describe another threat from a completely different domain, and that is the domain of ideas. Um, there's been an attempt to portray inequality and the people who suffer inequality uh, in, in much discourse in, in uh, Western societies as the people who suffer those inequalities, it's their fault. Okay, there's uh, been an attempt to, to say that uh, very often over the last few years. So indeed, the former Federal Treasurer of Australia, Joe Hockey, famously said that society could be divided uh, between leaners and lifters. Those people who make an effort and do well for themselves, and those people who perhaps don't make an effort and uh, need help from others. Um, now, the idea is that where people are in some way responsible for their inequality, that's of no concern for society. If it's your fault, you fix the problem. This has been a, a common and pervasive idea over the last few decades in, in many countries. Now, for egalitarians, this is very concerning, and it's very concerning for two reasons. The first is that, just imagine you're unemployed, you haven't got a job. Now, why are you unemployed? Well, perhaps you haven't made an effort. Um, perhaps there aren't many jobs. Perhaps there are a lot of people going for those jobs. Perhaps uh, the industry that you trained in no longer exists. Or perhaps you come from a family where resources were hard to find and you didn't get a good education such that you're no longer qualified for all sorts of work. The point about mentioning all these things is that the causal chain that leads from here to being unemployed is a complex one. And it's often very hard to disentangle all the different st strands of causation that make you end up being unemployed. So there's lots of grey areas when we try and affix personal responsibility to a particular inequality. But the second reason that we should be concerned about this kind of idea is just because it's very harsh. It is very harsh to say that because you have some responsibility for a disadvantage or an inequality, uh, an inequality, then the state or your fellow citizens no longer care or no longer support you. This just seems a very harsh thing to say. And what's happening here is that there's a battle of two different ideals. On the one hand, there's people who say that they want to place a conception of personal responsibility at the heart of our thinking about what society ought to look like and what justice ought to be. And on the other hand, there's people who say we ought to strive to live in an equality in a society of equals. Now, this battle ideas that are important is very important because it's these ideas we use to explain and to justify whether or not we should provide assistance to people who do suffer inequalities. And it seems to me that if you really do care about living in a society of equals, you shouldn't let the language of personal responsibility and choice trump the language of equality. So there's some threats to the idea of equality. Now, what ought we to do about this? What ought we do in, the, in response to uh, the various threats to us living in a society of equals? Well, one thing it seems important to do is that when we respond to a public problem, when we propose a solution to something that uh, needs solving in society, that we put equality first. So in any solution we propose, we say, will this solution increase equality? Or will it decrease it? So, for instance, the world only has... Well, when we talk about climate change, okay, there are two types of in injustices that are associated with climate change. One comes from the kind of harms that will result from changing weather patterns, uh, increased flooding, or the spread of disease. This is a harm and injustice that comes from dangerous climate change. But the other type of harm that comes from climate change is associated with our response. 
if we make the wrong kind of response to climate change, if we try and stop climate change or we try and adapt to it in a way that makes inequalities worse and makes the people of the world who already suffer disadvantages worse off, then we ourselves have created uh, a special kind of injustice and disadvantage. So, so let me give you an example. We can only put a certain amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere uh, if we are to avoid dangerous climate change. There's a limit to how much greenhouse gas we can put up there. So we have to decide, as, as peoples and countries of the Earth, how to divide the remaining rights to emit greenhouse gases. We have to divide them between countries and we have to divide them between peoples. Now, it seems to me that if you're committed to an ideal of equality, you will try and divide those emission rights in such a way that the people who already are badly off are not any worse off. So, for instance, this graph here shows that the people who, very often, people who have contributed least to the prospect of dangerous climate change are most at risk from the impacts of climate change. You can see there on the map, uh, people in Africa, for instance, have contributed very little to climate change, and yet they are very, very vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So when we're devising our response to climate change, we have to keep equality in mind. Now, you're probably thinking, well, uh, isn't this a very costly exercise? Do we have the resources to do that? Well, let, let me ask you a question. Do you like ice cream? Okay, most people like ice cream, and indeed, our European cousins, they like ice cream. In fact, they spend $11 billion a year on ice cream, which is $2 billion a year more than it would take to uh, provide clean water and safe sewers for people. Now, in Timor-Leste, which is one of the most disadvantaged and poor countries on Earth, they have around $1.50 a day in income. So why do I mention these? Well, because the world is already a very unequal place, but there are a lot of resources and a lot of wealth around that we can deploy uh, to solve these problems in a way that doesn't make inequalities worse. And indeed, indeed, it seems like that is exactly what we ought to do. So when we roll out renewable energy, for instance, or we subsidise it in some way, we should try and make sure that not only do we not increase inequality, but the resources we throw at a particular problem actually make equality more likely. So perhaps when we provide solar panels or encourage their use, we give them into institutions uh, that may need them, such as schools, or we give them to neighbourhoods which are already disadvantaged. And what that shows, I believe, is that even though something like climate change is an incredibly large problem, an oppressing problem, nonetheless, in our response to climate change, we have to, at the heart of our response, have a commitment to equality. And by having a commitment to equality at the heart of our response, we do two things. We make that response more acceptable and more palatable, but we also make it more likely that we get to live in a society of equal. And by doing those two things, it produces what I call an equality dividend. And that's something I think that we should have more of. Thank you very much.